Okay. All right. So, uh, so good evening, everyone. Um, um, uh, this is like our so welcome. Thanks for coming. This is the first of a series of uh, of classes that are um, going to devote uh, our attention to some of the really significant figures uh, who died in the past year. So it's sort of a grim topic, but it's uh, also we felt an important way to honor. Uh, some of the losses of the year. So all of these, uh, and actually when planning it, there were like another like three or four or five, I don't know, like really, really significant uh, uh, leaders who we could have added as well in this series. So it's a very, you know, of all the losses of the past year, um, it, you know, in addition to everything else, we also had uh, like just some significant, significant uh, communal leaders who, who died. And so we're going to try to use that framing as a way to sort of understand them and their contributions and, and, and hopefully learn something uh, in the process. Um, so Rabbi Sachs is the first we're going to address. I, I'm going to share a source sheet uh, digitally in just a moment, uh, and uh, and then and, and also in paper. Um, and I guess just uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm less used to the hybrid model of having people in person and also people online. So I guess um, it's a relatively small crowd. So if you want to ask a question or say something, you could just unmute yourself and make some noise and you know get my attention that way. Also, feel free to use the chat, which I will try to monitor. And those of you in the room, you have the advantage as well. Okay, so let me uh, first share the source source sheet digitally. Um, okay, uh, I'm not going to share my screen. I'm just going to. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, I'm just going to share the documents. You can sort of open it up on your own computers and sort of follow along um, as, as you wish. Um, okay, hopefully that works. Uh, in the meantime, okay, I'm back. Okay, so um, I, hopefully you that uh, everyone can open the document. You can see, okay, just a couple of pages, like it's a Google Doc, pretty okay. Um, of an outline of what I want to speak about with some with some some text I want to I want to analyze. Uh, so the opening the opening paragraph uh, is um, is a passage uh, that that Rabbi Sachs wrote himself. Um, he wrote this actually in reference to Rav Soloveitchik, uh, and but I actually think it is a very apt description of Rabbi Sachs himself. And actually, every time I see it, it like really from the first time I've seen it until you know today, it really uh, uh, reminded me of, of him. So I just want to sort of read it together. Occasionally in the history of the Jewish encounter with God, a thinker arises who lets us see our ancient tradition in a new light, like a poet describing an emotion we instantly recognize but never before were able to articulate. When this happens, within a faith, old texts reverberate with new meanings. Acts we had performed unthinkingly a thousand times stand revealed in their depth and power, as if for the first time we begin to understand why those who came before us did as they did, and we and the tradition are, are renewed. Okay, so again, that's that's Rabbi Sachs writing about Rabbi Soloveitchik, who certainly this was true for him. Uh, but I think it's really true for Rabbi Sachs as well, right? He he, um, so much of his writing, at least the writing that, that I've appreciated, has been and his teaching what was just was just describing what we've already been doing, right? And I'll give you an, we have here an example of that, but it, it, it's. Um, uh, right, it's it's not 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 necessarily it's not the, the newness of the idea, it's the. It's the it's the new perspective on, on something that that we've already been doing. And sometimes when reading his writing, I had the thought of uh, like, oh yes, of course, like like yeah, obviously, you know, right? Uh, but like you know, like like it's sort of like it's, it's like so it seems so true that like it was obviously true beforehand, and yet uh, you know he's the one who had to say it, right? So like, obviously it wasn't true, and and uh, and even formulating uh, you know like important ideas in a clear way and in, in a way that's compelling. Uh, that's also um, it's also a significant uh, contribution as well. Um, so let's just review the this the you now the we have a basic uh, biography. He was born in 1948. Um, uh, he died just in November 2020. Um, his uh, formal education was at St. Mary's Primary School, at Christ College, in Finchley, uh, and then his higher education uh, Gonville and Caius College in Cambridge where he has an MA in philosophy. Okay, so you'll notice he did not attend yeshivas, did not attend Jewish schools. Uh, his education was, uh, was in, it was a very good education, but not a Jewish education. 
Uh, while he was at Cambridge, he took a trip to New York. And there he had two, as he's written and spoken about, he had two very impactful meetings. He met with uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik and others as well um, in, in, uh, in Yeshiva University. And he also, he also met Rabbi Lamb uh, when he, on that same trip. And, uh, uh, and he also met Lubavitcher Rebbe, who was much younger then. And, you know, also, you know, well, everyone was younger then. Uh, and the quote that uh, appeared in his, uh, uh, this quote actually appeared in his obituary, uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik had challenged me to think Rabbi Schneerson had challenged me to lead, okay? And uh, I think that was, these were two uh, figures that had a really big impact on him. He went back to England and, uh, and he continued his uh, graduate studies and, and ultimately earned a PhD, but he also enrolled in, uh, in Jews College where he received ordination. And he also was learning at Eitz Chaim Yeshiva, which was a Haredi Yeshiva in London. Jews College is a, um, I don't know, distinctly British institution. I don't know a lot about it. It's, it's, it's not exact, it's like a, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know what to compare it to. It's really nothing like it here. It's, uh, um, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's an institution for training rabbis and other Jewish professionals and other, and for Jewish scholarship, but it's not um, like a robust yeshiva with like, you know, intense learning that you can stay there for years and years. And uh, it's a much, much smaller, what? No, 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 no. It's much smaller than Jews here. Uh -huh. It's it's orthodox, but but like British orthodox, so very uh, moderate and very you know you know England has an the, the has something called the United Synagogue, which is an established orthodox um, synagogue, like Jewish, you know like uh, there's an established church in England, right? It's the Church of England, right? And if you're not Anglican, you can you know there's like other religions that are also government sponsored for the other religions, right? So the Anglican Church is the official Church of England, and the Queen is the head of the church. Uh, and then if you're Jewish, then your taxes are diverted to support, you know, like the Jewish version, okay? And that's the United Synagogue, which is nominally Orthodox, but the substantial percentage of people who attend United Synagogue synagogues are not particularly observant. And the, uh, and Jews College is their institute. So the chief rabbi is in charge of this federation, this United Synagogue um, network of synagogues. And I think um, it's challenged by, you know, in, you know, by a sort of more, Sort of growing and more assertive um, Haredi ultra -orthodox, called ultra orthodox community, which uh, in the last let's say twenty years, thirty years has grown in numbers, and it's also challenged by non orthodox denominations, which didn't, which were like which are unofficial, but still exist in England and and don't accept the authority of the chief rabbi or of the of the United, you know, they're not part of the United Synagogue. Their synagogues are not part of the United Synagogue, and really both of those um, um, both sides of that were like sort of um, sort of. Uh, very much at play as Rabbi Sachs was chief rabbi, and he was sort of navigating in that, in that big mushy center. So it's to say, so it's, so it is orthodox. <laughs> Jewish college is orthodox, but it's orthodox in the context of um, of an official established um, state church that is responsible for a really broad spectrum of the country's Jewish community, including those who are not particularly observant at all. Okay, like it's it's a in a way it, you know that you know whatever and. and in the 21st century, most Orthodox in the United States have most of their membership, you know, are South observants and keep kosher homes, right? That's not the case in the United synagogues, synagogues in England, from what I understand. Um, and I would say in going to, you know, going, not going to like the education in England, I think it's also much less, like the Jewish education for these, most of these families is also much less uh, robustly Jewish than in many American uh, families. Anyway, so 1982, so he, so he did, so he did, uh, so, he, so he got, ordination from Jewish college. He also learned at Eitz Yeshiva Eitz Chaim, so he had a little bit of exposure as well to that uh, more Haredi Yeshiva, but it was not a very intense Yeshiva education. He was in graduate school um, this entire time, you know, doing, doing like a philosophy, you know, PhD. And so, you know, he didn't have the kind of the same type of uh, Talmudic, you know, education of, uh, you know, you know, considering how smart he was, how well read he was, and right, and how uh, educated he was, I think his Talmudic scholarship was not as developed, was not as broad. Um, okay. Uh, his first appointment, uh, he was at the rabbi of the Golders Green Synagogue, and then he was the rabbi of Mar Western Marble Arts Synagogue in central London, which uh, I think still exists. And, you know, I think, you know, it's a very like kind of posh synagogue. Um, and then in 1990, he was um, appointed as, sorry, 1991, he was appointed as chief rabbi, where he chief, position he held until 2013. Uh, 2005, he was knighted. In 2009, he was made a baron, and he joined the House of Lords. Okay, I think I first met him shortly after that. He was already Lord Jonathan Sachs when I met him. He came to Princeton, I think, three times when I worked there, and each of the times we were able to meet him. 
uh, one of the times he came to Princeton to give a lecture at, um, at the Divinity School and his office called the Center for Jewish Life to see about kosher catering options for this dinner that was gonna be held at the president's, president's of the Divinity School's home. And so we said like, oh, well, like the, the, the Center for Jewish Life, like the kosher kitchen on the campus, we could provide dinner, like we could send out dinner for this meal, but there was, no, there was be a need for it. It's like some Amashkiach would have to go along to like ensure that it was kosher once it left the hill, you know, to like to sit, be in the kitchen with, you know, so I got that job. So I like rode with the salmon, you know, from the Center for Jewish Life over, you know, across town to the divinity school. And then they let me uh, like uh, leave the kitchen and like, uh, and they actually, they had Sarah and we both like got to, you know, like hang out at this like little reception at the home of the president. And then we went to this lecture. He was invited to give this annual lecture at the divinity school. So that was fun. Uh, and then he came again, I think a few years later. And when he was promoting a new book of his and gave a big lecture at campus, but a few of us got to meet with him. And so it was, it was really very, um, that was cool. I don't know, that was like a fun, those were like fun, fun memories for me that getting to meet him. I sort of, uh, um, he was incredibly friendly and, and talkative and, and gracious. And I sort of enjoyed that very much. Um, on, on, the, on this first page of your sheet, you have a, um, a list of the books he published. This is from, uh, from his website. So I assume it's, um, it's comprehensive. It's a really, really interesting to just get a sense of his career, but you look at the books that he's writing and, okay, 1986, Torah study. So this is his, um, he wrote, he published Sichot from the Lavish Rebbe. Okay, 1986, well, the Rebbe was still alive, right? So that's, again, the sense of their closeness that, you know, that Lavish Rebbe inspired him to take on leadership roles. And then he actually then trusted him to be um, an editor of his, uh, some of his like actual, what? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. Well, again, like 1986, Chabad was much, much smaller, so they didn't necessarily, right? So in terms of their, if they're going to publish something in English, like, I don't know, like, in other words, uh, it wasn't necessarily the same resource. They didn't have the same resources to like, exactly. It was, it was a much, much smaller operation. I mean, they still maintain control of all their publishing, but I think they, yeah, in terms of like setting that job to someone like Rabbi Sachs, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I think it speaks his closeness, right? To, you know, and I think that, I have no idea. I have no idea. It's, yeah, so I don't, I don't even know this. I don't, I don't even know how many of the Sichot that he trans, he published. I don't know, is it 10? Is it like 50? Is it, I have no idea. And uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I've actually, I didn't, didn't know that he even wrote this until uh, very recently. I knew that he was, that he had like strong ties to Chabad throughout his life and he would speak at their conferences and they like promoted him, you know, like that I knew. Um, I didn't, this, this 1986, like this first publication, I, I did not know about. Yeah, you know, first like book, you know, he was, he was an editor of this book. He has editing uh, credits. A 1990 tradition in an untraditional age that was published, I think by Aronson. Uh, Arguments for the sake of heaven, the persistence of faith based on the BBC Wreath Lectures, Crisis and Covenant, Jewish thought after the Holocaust, one people, majority and Jewish unity, right? So these are all um, 1994, will we have Jewish grandchildren? 1995, faith in the future. Community of hope, faith, politics of hope. Um, these are all very, um, these are all Jewish books that are addressing a Jewish audience. Um, you know, I would say the early one, one people, where we have Jewish grandchildren, these are like very, like the chief rabbi is addressing the British Jewish community, trying to, you know, bring about a renaissance of Jewish pride and Jewish commitment and Jewish education in the United Kingdom. Uh, dealing with one people, tradition, and Jewish unity, like that was like very, that was like a fraught issue as chief rabbi, because he was dealing with the, the Haredi community and as well as the um, Reform and the Masorati community in the United Kingdom who were, you know, and trying to sort of occupy this, try to speak for British Jewry even as there were these like large communities that didn't accept uh, the, the chief rabbinate. Um, to that letter in the scroll, this, I don't know if anyone read that, have you read letter in the scroll? Okay, that's like a, you've read it, good. I think I recommend it to, no? no I didn't. What? I have a oh, yeah, you always have a choice. I did, I did encourage you, yeah, okay. Letter in the scroll is like, it's like a, I think it's very, very popular, I don't know, it's a very popular book. It's, uh, he sort of, it's his, uh, I, it's on my reading list that I recommend to people to read. He um, just talks about like being, um, and do you, wanna, do you wanna say a few words about it? Or you, you, any? Okay, great, right. 
Oh, wow. And it's short, it's very short. It's not a long book. And it's just like what it means to be Jewish, like to be part of this ongoing story, a letter in the scroll. You're like part of this broader story. Um, he give, you know, talks about, um, you know, he, he describes this metaphor, you know, you go to a library, right? And you see on any shelf, you can pick up a book and it, it's about any subject and it's an, you know, the, and then you can explore it, you put it, take it, you put it back on the shelf and then you find one book and you realize like you flip through the pages and it's a story of your family. And it's a story of what they did and each page may be different, different language and different style, but it's, it's your story. It's a story of your people and who you are and where you come from. And when you turn, you see there's a blank page and that's for you to like, you know, that's, that's a, what a beautiful, inspiring uh, image, uh, metaphor. Um, in England, that book was published as Radical Then, Radical Now, sort of how, like, what Judaism is about. Um, here it's still called A Letter in the Scroll. Okay, so strong recommendation of that one. Um, so then, 2002, um, he writes The Dignity of Difference How to Avoid the Clash of Civilizations. Um, so this is already a pivot. And uh, this is like a post uh, September 11, 2001 pivot where he feels he has a like a message to offer, not just to the, you know, to Orthodox Jews, not just to the British Jewish community, but like a message for the world. Like there are like major the like the themes of religion and secularism and tolerance and right, right and, and diversity and living together, despite like these are not um, small parochial, like it's not about like the, you know, like the United Synagogue and the reform movement, right? It's about, you know, it's about like, um, can we, can humanity like, you know, make it, you know, the next, for the, you know, for the next decade. And, and this book is, uh, is incredibly um, uh, popular and well-read and discussed. Um, and it re really um, like kind of leads to a, to a shift in his writing and teaching and speaking where from really from that point on, like his books are, like you can divide them. There are books that he wrote for a Jewish audience and there are books that he wrote for a general audience. I think that, that marks that pivot because he had a really large non-Jewish audience, okay? Um, so that's still continuing on, right? So in 2003, he published the Jonathan Sachs Haggadah, great Haggadah, strongly recommended, okay? If you, okay, I think I recommend it every year Pesach time, if you, some of you have heard me say that like four or five times. Um, Okay, and then from optimism to hope, like that's like general. To heal a fractured world, the ethics of responsibility, that's, that's general. And then 2006, he, the authorized daily prayer book. That's his first Sidor that he publishes in England. That's the British Sidor with his translation and commentary that became the basis for the 2009 OU Koran Sidor. Um, the home we rebuild together, creating society, that's like a general, that's a book for a general audience. Um, okay, and then 2009, the Koran Sachs Sidor, and then 2010, Coven and Conversation, they starts writing these, uh, you know, these books with Corin, these essays on the Parsha and the uh, introduction and all the stuff about uh, um, the holidays, the Machzorim come out, um, interspersed with, uh, not in God's name, confronting religious violence, okay, in 2015, okay, and, uh, you know, and then at the very end, in 2020, right, in the last year of his life, he published, um, you know, Morality, Restoring the Common Good in Divided Times, a book for a general audience, with, published with a general publisher, and uh, Judaism's Life-Changing Ideas, a weekly reading of the Jewish Bible, right, which is the, another the next, uh, like, volume of his, like, Parsha essays that were published in book form. So really, to the end, in terms of his publishing, was very, uh, really, really divided, and with the general audience and the Jewish audience, I think that's actually some of his, like, some of his significance, some of what he meant to the Jewish community was that like one of our guys was this like really important public intellectual. And aside from whatever the, the content of his ideas, there was something very um, like just, you know, like it, it like it meant something, I think, to know that like the, you know, the, the prime minister's most trusted, you know, uh, you know, clergy person of any faith, you know, the person that the BBC would turn to to speak about like matters of religion that like the, you know, the, the, the most famous religious intellectual in the Western world, you know, happened to be this, this Orthodox rabbi, you know, right? Like that was like a big deal. So aside from anything he actually said, like just that fact of who he was, what he represented was very significant. I think in a, you know, in some ways, I think Rav Soloveitchik had that same like utility in the 1960s. I, 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 um, in the sense that you could, you know, I had a, um, my, my, uh, you know, my, my father had a chavrusa in yeshiva and the two of them, they went to city college together 
while they were in yeshiva in the Lower East Side. And then after college, they, my father stayed in New York for graduate school and his Karusa went to, uh, went, left, left New York for graduate school. And he told me a story, uh, you know, but then that was like, this was like the 60s or whatever. So like, you know, 40 years later, he told me a, a story, 30 years later, he told me a story of like one of his professors or maybe it was an advisor or a supervisor so he became a, he became a, both of them, my father, they both became a psychotherapist. And my father, he told me a story of like one of his supervisors or something, or a professor or somebody had, you know, he showed, he gave him a copy of, of the Lonely Man of Faith. And he was like, oh, like, now I get it. You know, not, not that like, oh, now I understand like why, not now I, I want to be an Orthodox Jew. No, it's just like, now I understand that, you know, that, that there's somebody like, this isn't primitive, this isn't ignorant. There's somebody who's like really, really sophisticated who can write really compelling, psychologically compelling, philosophically compelling writing about what, about the human condition, you know, is also a really, you know, influential and significant um, Orthodox rabbi and communal leader. Like that, 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 like you could show that to your professor, you could show that to your supervisor, you could show that to your colleague. It's like, oh, like there's like, you know, there's, there's something there that's like really that's weighty. So I think in that, that in that sense, there's symbolic value, and maybe I think even just for you know what it meant you know for a generation or two generations of modern Orthodox Jews to know that you go to university and they could go to the professions and they could encounter ideas and they would know like even if you don't know like a lawyer or a physician like I don't know like you're you're you know a a pulmonologist from Englewood doesn't you know have to have an understanding of of Soloveitchik's, you know, epistemology of, of religion, this, they have to, but, but you have to know that like, you know, a really, uh, like a smart person, you know, you know, dealt with all these issues and, 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 and you know, and he, he worked it out, you know, and that, that's enough. So uh, it's like the symbolic nature of like, of religious authority figures and their credentials, their secular credentials, the fact that they're impressed that you could, that you could show them to others and, and find, who would find them impressive, I think, I think it meant a lot. So I, I think Rabbi Sachs as well, um, you know, he had that, he, he represented that for us. Okay, it was a very long way of saying a very simple idea, but I just, you know, that it's, it's nice when somebody who's from our community is famous for good reasons. Okay, that, that's basically what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes, not, yes. Good point, very, very good point. Right. So the major was not a, right, he was not a household name in America. I mean, you know, and not not nearly in the same way. Not nearly in the same way. Yeah, correct. Absolutely. Absolutely true. And yeah, it's a, it's it's funny. You know, it's interesting. You know, I will have I, I, tomorrow morning. I am delivering the the benediction at the uh, at the city council uh, meeting. And I was telling one of my kids that this evening, he says, oh, tomorrow I'm going to city council. And he says, oh, like, why they choose you? He's like, well, they probably like went on a list of like all the rabbis at Chicago, like, every clergy person in Chicago. And they, they got to me, you know, tomorrow, like, you know, my lucky day, you know? So I think there, there's this like, you know, like certain roles have certain visibility and like you called upon, but I think it was also um, not every chief rabbi is, has that, you know, right? I mean, so he, it's not just the role, right? It's like, sure, sure, that, that's true. I mean, you know, I actually, I heard him, uh, he, when, one of the times he came to America, he was interviewed by uh, Brian Lehrer, who runs a, has a public radio um, show in, uh, in New York City. So, so he interviewed Rabbi Sachs and Brian Lehrer asked him some questions about the institution of the chief rabbinate, which, you know, they tried in America once and it didn't work. There was no, you know, in New York, uh, Rabbi uh, Jacob Joseph was the first and last chief rabbi of New York. And, uh, um, I don't remember if Ryan Lair asked him about like why is there no chief rabbi in America and like or maybe certainly make, draw, drew, drew comparisons to England uh, between England and, and Israel, which Israel of course does as if have a chief rabbi in it. Uh, and Rabbi Sachs said, well, you know, there's a difference between rabbis can choose between power and and having influence. <laughs> and I think he said, you know, the Israeli chief rabbi in it has has power, and outside of Israel, rabbis strive for influence. Uh, which I, you know, which was a very, I think, astute observation. Um, I think the chief rabbinate in England does not have a lot of power. <laughs> it, it's a, it's a, it's a spotlight. It's a, it's a, it's a, a podium that you could make use of should you choose to. It is very, it is relatively little power, I think. Um, 
he definitely did, definitely, definitely did. Yeah. And his predecessor was, was Lord Jakobowitz, who also was, uh, uh, you know, not, not quite as broadly known, but also was, uh, like, I think Margaret Thatcher's famous, favorite clergy person was Lord Jakobowitz, you know, so for what it's worth, you know, so that, yeah. Um, um, yeah, right, right. <laughs> Right. Well, we'll say more about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let, let's look at some of his ideas. So there's a, the, the, on your sheet, there's a, there's a passage here from a, an essay he wrote called Tar Umar, the Unwritten Chapter. This was an essay he wrote also at a very young age, uh, relatively young age. Uh, it was published in a British Torah journal called the Ela, which I've never seen a hard copy of. It was republished um, very recently in, uh, uh, so it's a review of a book, Rabbi Norman Lamb was the, you know, very, also died this past year was uh, just a few months before Rabbi Sachs. Rabbi Norman Lamb was a congregational rabbi in Manhattan, and then he was the president of Yeshiva University for many years. When he was president of Yeshiva University, he wrote a book called Torah Umada, Torah and General Knowledge, in which he articulates like six different, you know, theories for why it's good and appropriate and, you know, for Jews to not only study Torah, but also to be involved in arts and sciences and the study of humanities and culture and et cetera. And like, so it's sort of like a, like a um, like an articulation, like a book length articulation of like a modern orthodox uh, ideology, you know, or certainly uh, of what he was trying to do at Torah Umad at, at Yeshiva University um, of, you know, what, of, you know, Yeshiva in the morning and a university in the afternoon and like how that, and the religious sort of understanding of, of that, of that synthesis. Uh, and so Rabbi Sachs wrote a review of that book. And then it was subsequently published in the, like the new edition, they republished the book in a new edition a few years ago, and they stuck on Rabbi Sachs's review as like an afterword or a forward. Uh, and then when Rabbi Lamb died, they published just a few weeks ago, they published like a memorial volume for Rabbi Lamb, and they published this essay of Rabbi Sachs as well, because it really, he talks about meeting Rabbi Lamb in this trip to America in 1968 and confronting him and sort of asking him, what is this Taromata thing? And, and um, noting that Rabbi Lamb never really quotes, quoted Rabbi Soloveitchik in that book on Torah Umada, because Rabbi Soloveitchik, that synthesis, he was much more, um, he was in the conflict stage. He, the synthesis wasn't him, like he was much more in the, the dichotomy rather than the conflict. Um, and then this, this, this is one passage, I, I think just very, you know, Torah Umada is a process rather than an ideology. It's the ongoing dialogue in which Jews reflect on the meeting between Torah, experienced as timeless command, and the time and place specific culture in which they have been set. That meeting has usually enriched both, Jew, both sides. Jews have taken and have given in return. And this piece I think was really, um, I don't know, I really, the first time I read it really, really struck me that the whole essay I think is worth reading. Uh, it's not about like a one way, you know, the, the, way this, the way Rabbi Lamb frames the question is how much of this outside knowledge and involvement should we take into and bring into our lives as religious Jews and, and integrate into our Torah study and our observance of mitzvah. I mean, Sachs points out, you know, in the, the 1990s when he wrote this, like Jews are already like, we're not, we're not just consumers of, of Mada, we're also creators of Mada. Like we're, we are the, you know, the, 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 the historians, we are the, the novelists, we are the composers, we are the songwriters, we are the, the TV producers and the and the script writers and, um, and the mathematicians and the scientists, that's us, and the, the government officials, that's also us, right? It's not the dichotomy of, you know, this foreign outside um, world that we have to then um, figure out a stance to how we're gonna confront and accept in what way and navigate, but like we're both sides of that equation. Uh, and we're not just, we're not just um, it's not just like a semi-permeable uh, membrane, how much do we take in? It's like, what are we going to give out? What are we going to contribute? Um, and, and I think that that also like really that was like a programmatic kind of statement for his career that it wasn't just that you know I'm going to be uh, I'll be a rabbi and I'll like my sermons they'll, they'll like my sermons because I'll quote Shakespeare or you know I'll or I'll you know I'll quote David Brooks and I'll like my sermons it was um, uh, it was like what is our as Jews who are also contributing to the world around us like what ideas that do we have that we can use to then shape the outside, uh, the, the world outside our shore. Um, and I think that's what his writing was about. That's what the speaking that was about. It was the teaching was about, right? That he felt there were values, ideas that, um, that were, could be, you know, informed by Jewish text and Jewish tradition and Jewish life.
that were of value to others. So chief among them is communitarianism. Uh, let me say so a little bit about communitarianism on, on one foot. Um, uh, modern liberalism is devoted to the, you know, like the rights of the individual. And if you think about like sort of liberal theories of justice, it's very much about, you know, human rights, the individual the rights of individual human beings, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, like whatever, right? Okay. Um, think, right, you think of uh, classic John Rawls writes a very famous book called, I think, like Theory of Justice. Right. And he writes about the veil of ignorance. So John Rawls is saying, how do you figure out if a society is just? And he says, well, imagine if all the people who are going to design the society would go into a room um, and they'd have to design all the rules of society and how we're going to how we're going to allocate property and how we're going to say who's rich and who's poor and who's going to have the political rights and who's going to have which roles in society but you're going to have to design that without knowing like who you're going to be when the society is built right like if you imagine like you're a bunch of souls you know like who haven't been born yet you know you haven't been sent down to earth and you're going to design a just society what kind of rules what kind of society would you set up right you don't know if you're going to be a man or a woman or black or white or, or a Okay, hey, rich or poor, or what you know, you're, you know, what your parents are going to be like. You don't know any of that. You're just a soul up in heaven, you know, deciding on, on the rules of a society. And then you'll be born. You'll have to live in that society, you know, and you, without knowing, you know, what role you're going to be. So the society that such, you know, souls, disembodied souls, would dis, would design that is the just society. Is that a good? That's a, okay, great. Uh, and and that you know, and Rawls is, thinks that you know, like he's advocating for a kind of like the modern, like you know, social welfare, like liberal state as, as such a society, which, which allows for um, private property and rich and poor, but such that, you know, the differences, all the, all of the, uh, we allow people to get rich because it benefits the poor as well. Right? And that's, that he thinks is like, whatever, that, that's, that's what he just said. The communi communitarian critique of the Rawls theory is that like nobody ever exists as a disembodied soul, right? Without, you know, uh, an ethnicity, a race, a gender, a family, right? A community that you're born, right? We all come into the world and we only exist in the world. Like individuals don't exist, only communities exist. We exist first and primarily like totally connected to in, in, in a way that can't be separated from our, um, our family and our culture and our community and, and who we are in like a very, very thick way. Uh, and so the whole, the whole premise of this kind of um, like conversation is, is false. And so you have to like kind of rethink about are not just the rights the individual has have, but what are the like, what are our responsibilities to one another? Like what type of like, what's, what does a community look like? Not just what does an individual, you know, deserve, okay? And a lot of Rabbi Sachs's writing was about, he felt like the, the Jewish idea of the covenant was, was very much an articulation of this, of this principle that it wasn't about the rights of the individuals, about a community, like a sacred community with a sacred mission, perpetuating itself over time and, and doing so by, by caring for one another, but in a, in like a web of mutuality, not like as a as disaggregated individual. Hmm? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think so. I, I mean, I think it flows from Jewish sources in a very real way, and 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 the the main like the more famous like the famous communitarian philosopher is. Uh, or a political thinker, whatever, is uh, Michael Sandel, who's also Jewish, and you know, has done, goes to Hartman in the summer and like studies Jewish texts also. So it's not, it's not a, you know, it, it's a, it's an easy mesh. But that was also that was an idea he felt that that we could contribute to like some of the the ills um, facing society. So I want to talk about some controversies here. Um, Dignity of Difference, that book that was like really sort of marked his emergence as a writer who's contributing in a major way uh, and and sustained way for the rest of his life for like a general audience, it was a very controversial book because of like one or two sentences. And we're going to look at how he, he backed down in those sentences. Okay, so the original sentence, in the course of history, God has spoken to mankind in many languages, through Judaism to Jews, Christianity to Christians, Islam to Muslims. Okay, that's, that's the sentence, uh, bottom of that second page. Reactions? Like it? Don't like it? See, it's kind of, what? So, so how literally you read it. So, so, what, say, so say more. Or 
Okay. Okay. So let, let, let's before we let's before we jump to what's successful or not. Let's sort of say like what is it? Like, like can you just say a little bit more. Like let's just write like what exactly does a sentence mean? Okay. Mitch, you want to say yeah? It's been on. You like it? Uh huh. Yeah, it Okay, so I, I think the piece that what yeah I have to say I, I when this I had a teacher in yeshiva who said uh, he said I read you know Rabbi Sachs's book I read this passage he said it made absolutely no impression on me whatsoever and then he paused and he said because I already agreed with that sentiment he said because yeah. <laughs> I, I already agreed with it before I read it you know so that's what he said so I, the piece that's contrary is he seems to be suggesting um, it's not not just that God cares about all human beings and God wants them to be good. That God actually is communicating to, like, to Christians through Christianity, which seems to be suggesting that Christianity is like the product of a divine revelation, right? That we God gave us the Torah, and God gave Christians Christianity, and God gave Muslims Islam. Okay, uh, so it seems to be suggesting not that you know, and which uh, okay, so that was that was considered objectionable to. Uh, elements of the British Haredi community, and he backed down and he issued a clarification, which is as follows. As Jews, we believe that God has made a covenant with a singular people, but that does not exclude the possibility of other people's cultures and faiths finding their own relationship with God within the shared frame of Noahide law. So there, I think the first part of that is similarly, um, similarly uh, like, can, could mean the same thing, right? That, but the I heard I heard David Hartman say this. Say this, right? The Torah tells us, the Torah is a book about the Jewish people's relationship with God. If you want to learn about, you know, like the French people's relationship with God, like don't read the Torah for that. That's not in the Torah, right? So they have their own story. You want to like like ask a friend. You want to know like what does God have to do with the French people, or you know, just you know, like ask a French person and he'll tell you like their story, okay? But like that's not what the Torah is about. We don't know anything about that from our Torah. It's not a universal book. It's a book, it's a book given to us that tells our story of our relationship with God. And if you want to, again, you know, like, you know, like, does, 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 do Chinese people have a relation with God? I'm sure they do. And if you want to learn about that, go ask someone from China and they'll tell you. Okay. But like, our book doesn't tell us anything about that. That's more or less what I heard David Hartman say. And I think he's kind of saying that as well. He's saying, look, we believe in our covenant. We believe God gave us the Torah and we're like committed to that. But just because God gave something to us doesn't mean that God didn't give something to someone else. Like, I don't know. Like, like, we're not, we're not there's no reason to like you know a does not imply not b right if you right there's no if you the logic um so, so that that's the first part of, the, of this clarified statement which i think could be very similar to the the censored removed statement but then the fact that he says within the shared framework of the noahite law i think is a significant uh limit of that um of that statement by saying well you know the content of that revelation is really is actually you know, we're going to look at it from the framework of our own uh, of our own faith and our own like tradition, which is, you know, which is what the Rambam does, right? The Rambam says like Christianity and Islam were like really valuable because through them, like millions and millions of people learned about like the one God and like you know, that's, and, and and all these important ideas about creation and revelation. That's really important. And so Christianity and Islam were like a mechanism by which knowledge of God spread to millions of people, right? So that's. But that's a little bit different from saying that they're the product of, right? So, so the clarification definitely, I think, you know, really, um, I think the clarification was a, uh, um, yeah, kind of kind of limited things in some, in some way. Okay. Ne next example. Let me just. So a few people have joined recently on the. Rabbi, do you think the clarification? Okay. Um, what was that, Mitch? One second. We have a, wait, uh, Robert, say say again. Do I think the uh, what? Do you think the clarification weakened his original premise? Yeah. So Robert's asking, did the clarification weaken the original premise? I think so. Unless, look, unless the, it could be that the clarification clarified the original premise. That's what he meant all along. That's possible. I think the clarification is is a significant weakening of the kind of radicalism of the of the of the original premise. I, I do think so. And I had one other. Yeah. Um, question or comment isn't this uh, going over the um uh, a recurrent theme of universalism versus particularism so this is this is the yeah the theme of universalism versus yeah that's so those are yes absolutely i think those are like 
um, big terms, right? Universalism, all human beings created in God's image and God loves everyone, everyone's equal, everyone's the same in really, really important ways. Particularism, we have this unique relationship to God through the Torah, but like, how do you, so yes, but then the question is like, like how do those two ideas like mesh and how do you prioritize them, right? And I think the, the first statement that was censored is sort of saying that we have our particular relationship and we also affirm that you have your particular relationship and you have your particular, and they're all like equally connected to God and, and we don't have anything special that you don't have. We don't have, we don't have a, not only a monopoly, we don't even have a, uh, uh, like there's, we, don't, we don't even have an advantage, okay? We have an advantage. So the next, another, two, there's another example here. In the uh, next, pay, um, next, two two more sentences that were that were censored. Okay, or one more sentence. Okay, um, the truth at the beating heart of monotheism is that God is greater than religion. He is only partially comprehended by any faith. He is my God, but also your God. Okay. Again, that that seems to be like you know like God is like so great and so big, like beyond human comprehension, beyond human language and, right? And so like, I, I just, I have this tiny perception of God, you know, by means of my tradition that I'm gonna embrace and, and, and invest in, but, you know, that doesn't preclude you, right? Okay. Maybe, I, I, maybe, I don't know. Could be, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so then, so then, the clar that was also clarified in the second edition he wrote the truth at the beating heart of monotheism is that god transcends the particularities of culture and the limits of human understanding he is my god but also the god of all mankind so i think what he's hiding okay i mean the second one is a beautiful statement right that god you know that there's no God does have, like that, that's the particularism of universalism. God has a particular relationship with me that I care about and I invest in and I cherish, but also God is the God of all mankind, particularly the universal and very nice. In the, in the sentence that he censored, he says a little bit more than that. He says that like, it's my religion, like meaning the Torah is not the, can't actually encompass like everything that God wants to say to, to the world or, or everything that there is to say about God, which is again, a more radical. So that was, that was so, you see, you see, you see, you see like a, a willingness to back down. You see, also like a willing, you know, um, um, in the, uh, you know, he's still saying something significant and, and like helpful for humanity, right? But maybe with a little bit less of the like kind of radical implications or the possible radical implications. But yes. Yeah. Maybe he was pushing Jewish chosenness in a more limited way. He's limiting Jewish chosenness to being like something like, it, yeah, it's not the be all end all. It's not the only, yeah, we were chosen. Yes, we have the Torah. God gave us the Torah, but like, you know, that doesn't give us, an, but you know, like you do you, you know, <laughs> like you like you have your thing, right? And then, you know, yeah, good. So it's interesting. It'd be good. It'd be interesting. It'd be an interesting. Uh, you know, kind of. You want. You know, the only, I'm thinking. I'm reminded of the uh, uh, the Meir Shilach, the uh, the uh, the Hasidic Rebbe of Ishbitz, who uh, among the more radical and antinomian and et cetera, et cetera, Hasidic thinker. He has a. He says that when the right. That's Anochi Hashem Elokecha. Why is it Anochi? I am Lord your God instead of uh, instead of Ani, which is a more simple way of saying I am. Right and in Hebrew, I say Anochi. So he says the added, and no one knows the answer to that question. Like all the, you know, all the Rishonim, everyone asked that question. So he says that the, the added cuff is the, um, it's the, the cuff hadimayon, it's the cuff of comparison. Um, like, like in Hebrew, meaning like, like as if. And so when, when, at, at the moment of the greatest revelation, when God comes down to Sinai and everyone's listening and the spoken thunder and, and the, right, the heavens open, what does God say? It's as if I'm the Lord your God, uh, uh, right? It's as if, right? like a little bit like, you know, like I'm not, because it's impossible for like all knowledge of the divine to be transmitted. Like that would be impossible. That would be idolatry to think that you have this comprehensive knowledge of God. So I'm just giving you, you know, it's, it's as if I'm the Lord your God, right? So that's a little bit like what you're saying that it's impossible to really know these things like really fully. And um, that's different from saying like, there's no advantage to like our revelation and our Mesorah, our tradition, right? That, that, that's, that's a... But other people's answers are just as right as ours is a different, yeah. 
Whereas I think maybe like what I heard Hart David Hartman say was 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 just uh, like I don't know I don't know he was just like you know I, I don't know like don't ask me about that that's not what our book's about you know like you know if you I, I I'm a rabbi like I'm a scholar of Judaism I don't know anything about you know the relationship of China of, of China and God like that's just not what our books are about that's not what our tradition we have no knowledge about that go ask them they'll tell you and you know whatever right our book is about our relationship with God okay Rabbi Sachs here in the world of globalization the world of clash of civilizations is actually saying no no it's really important for us to like affirm your connection to god through your religion okay. um, so some other controversies i want to sort of mention uh he got you know there was sort of uh, one is uh, i sort of alluded to earlier jewish pluralism his relationship with the reform movement in england uh was hard there was a famous like sort of episode where there was a very prominent from rabbi whose funeral rabbi Sachs didn't go to and then there was a controversy about that, and then he apologized, and then he wrote a letter in Hebrew to the Haredi, one of the Haredi Dainim, explaining why he didn't go, and then that was leaked, and so they got more in trouble, you know, it's a big mess. Uh, once he was chief rabbi, he didn't go to Limud, which is the big, big, uh, like, uh, kind of non-denominational Jewish learning culture festival that takes place every year, uh, and Christmas vacation in, in, uh, in England, uh, and he said, and he did not go, he, oh, he went, maybe, he did not go when he was chief rabbi. He did not go when he was chief rabbi, you know, even though like had he gone, he would have been like, like a rock star, you know, but like, you know, he, he didn't, he felt like as, and, 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 this, and that's sort of the other like irony, right? Like, you know, God spoke to like Christian, to, to Christians through Christianity, but like, but like, but, the, but like reform Judaism, that's a step too far, right? Like that was like a very sort of a, it was almost a paradox, right? That his, for all his like, you know, nobody and, and like, you know, few people, few Orthodox rabbis have said as, I'm sorry. He did back down, but he still, he's still even the revised version is still among the most uh, like articulate expressions of religious pluralism, you know. But that religious pluralism didn't extend within Judaism, right? He felt like orthodoxy was the boundary of authentic traditional Judaism, and so he couldn't or didn't feel like it was appropriate to have a pluralistic approach within Judaism. But like among faiths, he felt it was so. It's a little. I don't know. You could. You could. Uh, so I, presumably, I, I, I think that's probably true. You know, I don't think he had any, you know, that I think, I think that's probably true, but. Um, I think it was, I think there was, there was definitely face pressure from the, from the Haredi element. He definitely was deferential to that element of the Orthodox community. I, I think he also, to some degree, he must've believed it also, right? Like, I don't, you know, I think he must've, you know, like he must have believed it also. Right? So I think it was some combination of pressure that resonated with something he felt was true. And so philosophically, maybe it was a little bit of a difficult thing to thread about like being very embracing religious pluralism, but only between faiths, not within his own faith. But I think you could you could touch it. Like it's not impossible to do. Um, and um, uh, but that was like a that was like an element. And then the other, you know, like there were no like big, you know, I don't think major progress. I don't think, you know, I I didn't look at. I don't want to. No, whatever. I. My sense is that there wasn't major progress made on like, you know, helping Agunot or like all these other like kind of vexing, like halakhic issues exactly facing the British Jewish community. Um, and which is also kind of related, right? In terms of like where he felt confident and where he didn't feel confident and that. He didn't have like, a, he didn't have his Gemara halakha education didn't match his like education in Makshava and thought and in philosophy, et cetera. Uh, his writings are much more quotes the Bible a lot, right? Quotes Jewish philosophy a lot, quotes general literature and philosophy a lot, doesn't quote lots and lots of like rabbinic texts in the same way. Doesn't doesn't seem to have that kind of fluency with rabbinic texts in his writings, et cetera, and speaking. And and I, you know, what some another somebody once once compared it, you know, and it with in a tragic way to the you know, when, when the spies uh, report back what they, they the giants in, in Canaan, they say, we were, uh, right? We were, we were, they were so big, we were like little grasshoppers compared to them. And they also thought we were grasshoppers, right? And, you know, so everyone asked, how do you know what they thought? So according to, I think Rashi says, we overheard them saying, oh, look at those little grasshoppers. Okay, so that's, but like, I, I think actually it's a, um, it's a, it's a depiction of like a catastrophizing, lack of self-confidence where you have like imposter syndrome, you have a lack of self-confidence, and then you assume that everyone else sees you in the same, like, 
really low way that so there was a real I think there was a lack of confidence in that realm of like you know like maybe you know like what you know like to be a halachic innovator to be someone who's going to like defend his halachic position etc against very very learned dianim in the Haredi community and he didn't it didn't seems like he didn't feel that um or people have suggested that he didn't feel that kind of confidence in in that halachic way you know and, and it's interesting compared you know like the chief rabbi mervis i think has been uh much less uh, flashy, not a, you know, not much less likely to, you know, whatever, hang out with, uh, you know, Elton John or whatever, but like, you know, but I think has been, I think he's like pushed the bar a little bit more on some halakhic issues and sort of sort of internal Jewish communal um, issues that require, you know, I don't think Ray Mervis is like a, you know, he's not a gadol hador, but he has a little more confidence in like, you know, sort of like this we can do and this I can say, and this, you know, you know, whatever, in a way that Rabbi Sachs didn't quite, uh, maybe didn't have. Um, I'm sorry. Has Rabbi Mervis gone to the mood? That's a great question. Yeah, then he asked if Rabbi Mervis has gone to the mood. Like, has that position that the chief rabbi doesn't go to the mood? Has that continued? Uh, that's a good question. I also wonder if Rabbi Sachs went to the mood when he stepped down from chief rabbi. I don't think he did. After he was chief rabbi, he came to America. He spent half his year in America. He spent a lot of the time in America. He had a position at NYU. He had a position at Yeshiva University. He taught and he, you know, lectured and stuff like that um, and wrote. Um, okay, I want to say one more, oh gosh, all right, one more point, okay, translator and expert, so the role that I think he really, that I like really appreciated him in a, in a really strong way was as a translator and explicator, okay, so translator, like literally, he wrote like a beautiful translation of the Sidur and the Mafsarim, and uh, I think that's just incredibly valuable to have I mean, I've spoken about this in this congregation many, many times, and I don't know, like, you know, <laughs> repeat myself too much, but like, I just think it, it just translate to be a translator, you have to love two languages. You have to have a sense of language. You have to have a sense of the beauty of language. And uh, I think the, you know, I think the Korah and Sachs Sidor and the Maxrim have that, like, you can tell that they were, the translation was written by somebody who read widely in English and understands the beauty of the English language. And, you know, obviously knows Hebrew really well, but also like loves the English language and is, and, and is taking the care to like write something. So I can, you can walk into the shul and you've never been to a synagogue before and you don't know anything about Judaism. I can give you a, you know, a sax sidur. And I'm like, you know, you're not gonna, I'm not, and I know that, um, I know that like, I'm not gonna be embarrassed. <laughs> I know that you're gonna open it and you're gonna like encounter like beautiful words, like express really beautifully. I know the commentary is going to help you understand what's happening and it's gonna be like appropriate for like what a, the types of questions and concerns a modern person may have. Um, and uh, and that's that's special. He wrote introductions to all of the, you know, his introduction to the Sidor is a masterpiece and worth reading. He wrote an introduction to um, all of the Mahsarim, which are also really worth reading. And then they took all of those introductions and they published them as a book called, um, what's it called? Like Festivals of you know, Celebration, um, Ceremony and Celebration, okay? So, yeah. That's a collated reading of all five introductions written for the current Mahsarim collection. Okay, so that's 2017. So that's like a really great book. I think I also recommend that to a lot of people, right? It's a great, like really great essay. And so this is like the first sentence I have here, like uh, maybe we'll close with this. This is the first um, sentence of his introduction to the Yom Kippur Maxor. And it just captures like, if you could, you know, right, I'm gonna read it. Now. Yom Kippur is the holy of holies of Jewish time. Second, sorry, two sentences. Observed with immense ceremony in the temple, almost, Miraculously reduced. No. Mm. No, sorry. Most miraculous. No, that doesn't. Oh, got. Gotcha. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. The, the, sorry, I must have. Uh, Observe the immense ceremony in the temple. Reduced after the temple was destroyed. Miraculously sustained ever since with unparalleled awe. It is Judaism's answer to one of the most haunting of human questions. How is it possible to live the ethical life? without an overwhelming sense of guilt, inadequacy, and failure. And I, I uh, right, it's like, oh, like, of course, right? Like, you know, like, like, that's what I was sort of saying before, like, like oh, yes, of course, obviously, like, that's, that's what Yom Kippur is about, right? It's just like primal human need. Like, I want to be ethical, but I like know that I fail. Like, how do I, how do, I do that? That's what Yom Kippur is about. I'm like, oh, yes, of course. So I just, this and I think he did this with Sukkot and did this with the Sidor. He did this with like so much of his writing. It just, it, it takes, like, once you say that, it's like you knew that forever, right? You know, once you say that, it's like, well, obviously that's what Yom Kippur is about. I, like, of course, but like, until he wrote that and articulated it in such a, such a precise way, 
maybe you, you didn't know that. And I think that's really helpful for like a newcomer, for someone who's exploring Judaism, for someone who doesn't know what Judaism is. Like you can hand that to your coworker and be like, yeah, what, you know, like, where, you, where were you yesterday? Oh, I was observing Yom Kippur. You're like, here's the essay, what it's about. Here's a, here's a sentence explaining what's, or you can also read it for yourself and you're gonna go into shul at Yom Kippur. And you're like, hey, here's what I'm doing okay, in shul for, for 10 hours. This is what it's about. It's about like, I'm trying to live an ethical life without being, um, you know, totally, um, um, overwhelmed by guilt and adequacy and failure. And that's what this day is about for me, right? So I, I think that, that, that he really had a gift, I think, in, in explicating and explaining and, and translating, right? Not, not just literally, but metaphorically, like what we do into like language that can help us appreciate what we do. And I think that gift was really unparalleled. Um, he uh, was working on a, a humash at the time of his death. Like he, I think he completed already his own translation of the humash, of the, his translation of the Torah. Uh, and with the editors at Koran, they were working on a one volume, like first synagogue use chumash um, that, you know, could replace, you know, the Hertz and the, you know, the art school, whatever, you know, one volume synagogue chumash uh, people are using. Um, they, they still are hoping to finish that. They, ha they feel they have enough material to finish that. I think maybe a year or two, it's going to come out. And so that'll be also a really wonderful, like legacy that, uh, again, you could walk into a shul and like, have a chumash and like, it'll be, you know, the, the, the Torah's words will be like, you know, explained in like an idiom that's like, that is, that is contemporary and relevant and helps you appreciate like what it is that, that we've been doing. Okay, next week, uh, the series continues with Rabbi Steinsaltz and then we have a few other and then, and then we continue on afterwards. Uh, yeah, Mitch, you wanna? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn this around so people can listen also have fun. Okay. So, so speak louder so you can. Yeah. Yeah. You could find, you can find, yes, that's great. So yeah, uh, that's true. You can find on YouTube his speech in the House of Lords uh, as a baron uh, condemning anti-Semitism. I think that is, uh, uh, that's definitely uh, like a legacy that 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 was important. To... Yeah, 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 yeah. No, because he had that audience. He used his audience in the corridors of power to speak about ideas that are concerned for him. I think. Uh, yes, yes, that's a, yes. No, then that's a, like. That, that's true. That's a good point. That's a very good point. And I think that's like, that's like sort of what the, what the Lavatri Rebbe told him, right? Like to be a leader, to be a leader means to take responsibility. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. Yeah, that's a good, a very important point. Okay. It's, I want to respect everyone since nine o'clock. So um, thank you. You can think of other ideas or questions, send them to me, text me, email. Um, and uh, thank you so much for, for joining. All right.